Hello everybody and well once again to another live session here on YouTube. Now as you know this is the uh, part 2 of painting this lovely Kestrel and it's all in aid of the Patchings live event today and also for the paintersonline.co.uk so you ready? Let's make a start. Okay here we go. Now the first thing we need to think about doing is working on the feathers. Now I've already done as I mentioned in part 1 some of the feathers around the bottom here. But I'm going to go through all those layers that I've gone through to work on the top of the head, around the eye and obviously underneath the beak as well. So bear with me while I get everything set up here and ready to go. And we're just about there anyway. As you can see all my paints are dried up from yesterday so I just need to reactivate those paints and get them all kind of ready to go again. See that's the beauty about watercolour is that you can just reuse what you've been using and that's what I like doing about watercolour because well, as I mentioned yesterday, it doesn't smell or anything like that, so it's really, really useful. Um, okay, here we go. Let's get stuck in. First thing I want to do is get my spray bottle, which is this one here, and very lightly spray my paint, which is what I did yesterday. Again, I've done this about 10 minutes ago. So just kind of go through it again for you so you know what I'm doing. And that'll just soften those paints down, but do it, as I say, about 10 minutes before you go to start on a paint, and at least that way round you're ready to go and it's going to soften those paints down slightly within these half pans. And we'll do the same again as well within my mixing palette. Which is that one. <laughs> there we go. I don't, you don't have to really, really soak it. But obviously that will weaken the paint that's already in there. But at least now we can reactivate that paint and start afresh with it again. That's what I like about watercolors, as I say, is that you're not wasting too much in the way of paint. Not that I'm one for wasting things, because I don't, you know. I don't like to kind of waste paint when it's uh, you know, very useful to kind of keep it. I don't like throwing things away. So the first thing we're going to do is go from a mixture of the burnt sienna and the raw umber. And we're going to work on the top of the head first and we're going to be adding lots and lots of detail in there. Now to work on the detail we've got to think about the light layers first and then gradually get darker as you go along. Okay. So when you look around here, where's my pointing stick? This is the way I've done this already off camera. I did say I was going to do this yesterday, otherwise it would be a very long, 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 long video. And the way it tends to work is that you'll start off with a wash that we did in part one. Okay, you can just see this underneath now. And you can see why we do that, because that kind of sets that foundation, that base, as I spoke about yesterday, about how all the feathers and fur as well, by the way, tends to work on the layers. So we've got the first layer here, which I've already started that part there just by using a very weak wash of raw umber, burnt umber, that kind of mix and then gradually adding more layers over the top as I've gone along and increasing those layers, there's probably about five layers of paint here and that's including probably the white as well again I'm going to go through all that now so first colour we need is going to be the raw umber now raw umber as we know within our palette here is this one here, there you go Get it working. Use my old mixing brush once again. Load it up. Come on, you. You can do it. Go on. You know, you can do it. There we go. Thank you very much. And then that is what we're after. And you want more than you think you'll need. And all I mean by that is that when you're mixing colours, and you're mixing probably, I don't know, three, maybe four colours together to get the colour that you want. Um, you tend to find that if you don't mix enough, I know it's not very easy to remix that colour again. But because we're just using, at the moment, just two colours, which is raw umber and a little bit of burnt umber. Not too much. Probably a little bit more. There you go. Something like that. And I'm going to water that down just a fraction as well. Yeah, one little blob. Of water in there that'll do okay now one thing I use you're gonna laugh at this in a minute is something I call the replicator brush all right something I made up myself and we know that you can buy some very clever brushes on the market which are coma brushes I don't know if you ever used a coma brush it's one of these and this will paint probably about three maybe four lines in one go but I tend to use old brushes, which I'm literally about going to throw away in the bin or in the trash. Just something like this here. And I know, stop laughing, please. Thank you very much. And all I've simply done 
to go to pair of pliers. I'll pop a little video clip up there for you so you can just go to that video after the after you've watched this one. And I've squished it down. This was going to go in the bin though. Don't do this with a decent brush, whatever you do. Squish it down and pull. Turn it over, squish it down and pull. And basically all I've done is created where's my colour there? And a bit of scrap paper. Yeah, we used this one yesterday. I don't like to waste things, you know what I'm like. And we can create quite a lot of lines in one go. As I said, I'll look at the link and I go into a bit more in depth on how I made this. See that? So that's how quickly we can add those initial layers. Now I only use this usually for, I don't know, the first couple of layers or so. After that, I like to use my size double zero brush because this is great and it's a good way of kind of getting small details on fairly quickly, even though you should never rush your painting, okay? We can get it on fairly quickly. And the beauty of it is, is that it lines and just layers that, you know, the paper, as I said, um, with all the lovely colours as you're applying them. But the problem is, is that the lines can be very parallel. Because you're working with, at the moment, two prongs, but that does very often go into three. <laughs> Depends how much paint I've got on the brush. I know, I know. Um, is that they can look a little bit a little bit side by side and because of that it can look artificial so use it for just the first two couple of layers let's say thereafter what suggest you do start working then with your size double zero brush or a small kind of fine tip brush that you've got whatever size you've got to apply those finer lines and those darker tones especially so start working on those darker layers so just using raw umber and burnt umber and adding this now just to a as I said like a more more of a watery consistency at the moment just to get that first layer on thinking about the shape all the time look at the way it curves around but I'm adding these lines by kind of curling them around without a paint by kind of curling them around like so and that's the way I've gone around the top of the head there but I'm overlapping these like elongated crosses at the same time See what I mean? So kind of elongated crosses. There you go, that kind of thing. So that's all I'm doing on here. And I'm trying to see where they, they tend to come round about here, kind of hook in, don't they? Just above the beak. Just take a little bit of paint off that brush by tapping it on some kitchen roll. Um, just zoom into that photo a little bit. Again, this is why I tend to use a very large photograph and it's very handy because you'll be able to just zoom into that reference photograph and look at all those fine details. If you can get your own photo, even better. There's a lot of free sites on the internet for royalty free photographs you can find. Okay, so have a look around. Some really good ones out there. Just make sure that if you are going to use photographs and you're going to sell the painting or anything like that, then really should try and get yourself a royalty free one. Uh, trying to see where that goes around there. Now this gets quite pale there, but I'm going to use a little bit of white on top of this as well. Just like I've done now and down there, you know, to kind of really kind of bring out the light areas. I'm just pulling out just a few tiny ones just to the left hand side of the beak. So I know we've gone straight into the painting process today because I know we've got a lot to do, a lot to cover, literally. All right. <laughs> but look how quick this replicator brush of mine let's cover this one area so it's covered it really really quickly to kind of just get that first layer on now when we look towards this area down here that's more of a kind of blacky a blacky blue blacky blacky brown there you go that's very technical terms isn't it but it is though it is isn't it you know i'll look at things in a very simplistic way don't no comments please thank you very much indeed um, but I do, and that's the way I tend to look at artwork in general, the way I tend to paint. I don't look at all the technical jargon. It's not me. I like to paint in a more kind of easily explained way, because that's the way I tend to think it in my own head. <laughs> yeah, that says a lot, doesn't it? Thank you, everybody. Now, uh, I'm just trying to see where that goes around there. So I'm going to keep adding this colour in just initially, because it's going to blend in to other blacky blue and blacky brown colours. That's going to be lamp black and burnt umber and lamp black and phthalo blue. <sighs> okay, got the idea. Yeah, of course you have. And I've already got those colours mixed up as well. But I don't want them too thick at the moment. 
Remember this little dinky palette of mine? There you go. And that was phalo blue and lamp black. So add some water in there. And I want this again to a watery consistency. Now if somebody asked me where this palette's from, I've got no idea. Because uh, I was given it a few years ago um, from a friend or by a friend. And let's just say they're, they're very old. And they came with some tinned paints, half pan paints as well which you can't get now you know the actual half pan cases you can't get the tin ones not that particular tin anyway you can get some tins um so a nice little palette that as well and ceramic palettes are very handy to use so you know you have to bear that in mind if you can get ceramic it's a way that the water tends to dry nice and flat within ceramic palettes so i'm going to add this in first of all that's a little bit too blue so i'm going to get a little bit of black in there. That's a Madonna song, isn't it? Too blue. Or oh, true, oh, true blue. Oh, yes. oh, okay, okay, Paul. A little bit of lamp black in there. I'm messing about. I'm sorry. Act seriously, Paul, for a change. There we go. And then just get that off there. But always make sure that if you're using your homemade version of the replicator brush, take some of the paint off first, like so. And then start using it that way around. Now that should be about. Oh yeah, that's it. That's got it. He bargain lad. He's got it. And we can start adding that in now. You can tell I'm a northerner, can't you? Look in the direction that the um, the feathers grow or go. And I can see the way they sweep down. So around underneath the eye here, I've got the photograph probably zoomed in a little bit too close. Where we've got this little area underneath the eye, you can see that in the reference photo just there. See that area there? So I'm just going to darken that in just a little bit, just using these sideways. I know, you can do these things, we can do it, can't we? It's our painting, we can do whatever we want with it. It's entirely our choice. And start to look at these brush directions, the way it sweeps down like a little elongated S. See that? Going all the way down there. And then these kind of break apart down this, uh, this this area here. However, there is a lot of white in this. So we're going to have to go dark to begin with. And the reason why is because when we add the white over the top, we need the dark underneath. You can't have dark without light or light without dark. You need both to kind of make this world we live in work. Um, another Bob Ross saying, I think, something like that. But it's very true though, isn't it? It really is. You need both to make it work. So... We're going to have to do a little bit of mid-tone first of all with this kind of blacky blue colour. Look at the brush direction all the time. A little bit more down there. Hope everybody's okay today. And a little bit more there. But I'm barely touching the paper at this stage. See how they're all kind of converging around that area there. They're coming down, that's going up. And as before, my eyes are literally every few seconds glancing towards my tablet in front of me. So we've got a tablet, an iPad, a very large phone, or a computer screen, of course. Then you'll be able to see these, uh, the photograph I've supplied for this, quite large indeed. And it's one of my own photos, I know. I did alright with this one. Now these come towards like a little V shape. So again, I'll just show you that so you can see it clearer. Um, around this area here, what they basically do, they kind of, see these little Vs? So that goes that way. So if you think about a clock face, so I tend to describe things quite regular. That's heading more towards, let's get it level. That's heading more towards two o'clock, see that? And then it kind of works its way around pointing more towards four o'clock and then you've got a gap which is where the white will be and then towards four o'clock and all the way along and they gradually curve so they curve sort of that direction as you work around here and that's what I'm looking at now if I can try and explain to you what I can see because I can see clearly now the rain is yeah okay and so I'm doing these little tiny little arrows if you wish Just lifting them up. Still using my fantastic replicator brush. 
Doesn't matter as long as it works, eh? Who needs expensive brushes? In fact, I don't use any expensive brushes saying that. I mean, I use the, um, the brushes I use, I just kind of run through those with you again, in case you didn't catch it on part one. Um, I don't use a wide array of brushes. The brushes I tend to use are a size double zero, a size one, a size five, okay, they're my main painting brushes. I've got an old, old, old brush for mixing the paint with, which I've shown you. And I've got a size 18, pardon? Yeah, honest, I've got a size 18 brush, which is big for me, isn't it? It's humongous. But I use that for doing backgrounds. If we had a background on this, for example, if we did one, if I do a background, I do it before I start a painting. I noticed somebody put a question in there before I went live, I had a quick nose. And um, somebody asked a question about, about do painting the background. If you are going to paint a background on this and you haven't started this yet, then you can do, but do that before you start the painting. That's why I always do it. So I'll do the drawing like we did straight away. So get the drawing on the paper, okay, which I did before we started on part one. And what you'll need to do is get a little bit of masking fluid. I tend to use a blue masking fluid. You have to give it a light mix. So it's a little bit not mixed underneath because it's been stood too long. So give it a light roll around just to lightly mix it. Don't shake it though, because it'll go all bubbly. And then add probably about half an inch of masking fluid all the way around the inside edge of the um, the Kestrel. Once that's dry, you know it's dry because it becomes tacky to the touch. It doesn't come off on your finger. You don't stick to it. I hope not. And then you are then able to um, add the background wash around the edge of that, it doesn't matter if it laps onto the masking fluid then does it? And once it's all dry, after laying it dry for um, just for a couple of hours or so at room temperature, then you can peel that masking fluid off. Don't dry it with a hairdryer though, because it can cause a masking fluid then to tear the paper because it help. you know, the masking fluid can actually harden and uh, sink into the paper a little bit and it can occasionally tear the paper, so be careful, okay? So if you don't want to paint a background, you can on this little kestrel. Right, okay, so that's the blacky blue. I might add a little bit more actually just down there. Just looking down underneath. It's quite dark around that area as well. I'm trying to line this up. I can just look at the photo there on the side there for a minute. You see what I mean? Where this lines up with the bottom of the yellow area of the beak, and it kind of comes down to about there, doesn't it? Like a little line not quite level so when you get my test card here it's not level like that it's probably a slight tilt do the same on the reference photo as long as everything's nice and level your painting's level and the reference, photo the reference photograph is level then you can work out your angles that way as well um, and then that goes down the bottom there like that light a little bit more and I think what I might do is start working on the blacky brown now. Yeah, we'll do. Okay, back to the large palette. So this is my lamp black and burnt sunburn. So I'm going to put a little bit in there, first of all, and some water. Again, I want it to be a watery consistency, just for now, a little bit more, I think. Just for now, we will be going darker. But as with all watercolors, we like to start light and gradually get darker as we go along. Now, here we go. So I'm going to use this colour now just to start adding in a little bit more of this mid-tone by thinking about those that little V-shape I've just shown you how to do within this area. We don't need to preserve any whites. I don't paint that way. I tend to use white paint as you know, unless we did the you know like the spot in the eye. You can do it that way around. You know, people say, why don't you just fill it in and just paint over the top with the white paint? Well. I want some of this colour to show through in places and if you just go and fill it in straight away then you find that you haven't got any anything underneath if you want to pull some paint off to create some extra effects there's nothing underneath it you know that colour will show through if you pull the paint off as well so it's wise just to take your time with it just be prepared get it all prepared in the background sort of thing I tend to kid it in a way you know what you see on the top of a painting is Let's let's I'll tell you what. Let's put a stage up, okay? We'll we'll have a stage. We'll have an act on the stage. Now there's somebody acting on the stage, but there's a lot of things taking place behind the scenes, 
and that applies to a painting. Because there is, there's all this detail taking place behind the scenes. But what you see is what's going to be on the surface of the painting, which is a little bit of this. Like people peeking their heads out around the side of the curtains <laughs> in the middle of the show. As you go along there, that's it. Okay, so that's layering quite nicely there, as you can see. And I'm working my way down just underneath. Okay, now I'm going to go for that blacky brown again, but this time it's going to be a little bit thicker, more of a milky consistency. Okay. Oh, and also, if you don't mind, pl click on subscribe down below as well, if you don't mind. I'll just pop that up for you. Um, because if you subscribe to my channel here on YouTube, if you're watching this on YouTube, please do, then you'll be able to... Um, get notified so click on subscribe and then the bell icon because at least that way around if I, when I put a video on here you'll be informed when I'm live and when there's another video just come out okay so you shouldn't miss any then if you like what I'm doing then thank you very much indeed and you'll be able to kind of keep up with what I do then okay so gradually adding this color around where this kind of light area goes You know, people say it's quite a process, but if you're not talking, if you've just got the radio on and just relax into yourself. Oh, we've got a cup of coffee today, by the way. I've got one going cold here. I'll drink it later. <laughs> um, then you tend to find time flies. It does for me, you know. When I'm painting, when I'm not doing the videos to my website, then time just flies by. It really does. Um, because you just sat relaxing. You know, you've got to try and get that block of time for yourself when you're painting. You really do. Now, looking at this, what I'm thinking about doing is, as I say, gradually increasing the thickness of the paint as I go along. But I want to get that warmth underneath first. So using this replicator, first of all, just get that around there. Okay. Right. We're going to go for that mixture that we did yesterday in part one of the raw rumba the burnt umber, burnt sienna and alizarin crimson which was that one there so I can just re-wet it again simple as that get out of that corner you there you go, that's better alright, load your brush wipe some of it off so you got to load it normally I'd roll it, but I can't do that with this one and then take a little bit off and give it a tap on some kitchen roll again and then we can start adding the warmer kind of tones and hues we can see to the top of the head so this will start to warm up the background and we'll add some detail over the top of this as well so this is gradually building as you can see now and by doing all these layers it will all pay off in the end because when we start adding those darker marks in and the light on top of that in places that's when it comes together that's when you get the three-dimensional feel to the painting and how it all works Okay, so just very lightly overlapping these lines as I go. I'm also considering the length of the lines as well. These tend to sweep obviously in that direction, but they're coming down that way as well and then over that way. So again, just look closely at that reference photograph. Just for these background details and adding these in. Okay. I'm going to warm up down there as well because it's a little bit dull down there actually. Now, if you have any questions you want to ask, um, you're welcome to type them as well. Um, and I'll have a look at the comments later on. But also, if you click on the, I'll go into the description below the video and type a comment, that will always be there. Okay, that will always be there in the description. And I will certainly reply to those down there. So if you've got anything you want to ask me, and then please pop it in the description down below and have a nose and don't forget as well if you want the reference photograph and the outline drawing for this painting which I've created for you ready then pop it again in the description down below and you find my link to my website uh, where you can download the reference pack okay if you're watching this on painters online then you'll uh, have a link below the video there as well okay so just Working my way down there. So that's warmed the top of the head up now, isn't it? So that's got all that warmth in there. So now we've got to think about shaping it up a little bit. And to do that, 
we're going to start adding a darker color so I'm going to carry and just add a little bit more down there first so I'm working my way around and just looking where it's needed so let's notice underneath the beak how warm it is just there look that's due to the shadow that's coming from that beak in that area okay wash that brush out oh, I'll tell you what we'll do just while we're using the same color let's just add some down here as well just realize that just that first layer again considering the direction the brush strokes go in as well that eye is standing out quite well at the moment well mention eyes as well if you fancy um, painting eyes I've got a playlist on that I'll pop the little link for the playlist on painting eyes in the corner there for you so you can do that I'll do that after we've gone live okay so if you fancy learning how to paint eyes and see the way that I tend to work on different eyes um, then you'll be able to do that and that's yeah eyes are just one of them things which I like to paint first as I said before and um, so you can keep looking back at that when you're working on all this lovely detail so again, I'm overlapping these lines, gradually working my way down just for the first basic layer. I'll add a little bit into the wing, which you can barely see. Let's have outline these areas as well. So like I mentioned in part one, go around all the pencil marks and just outline them other than any outside lines, because if you do the outside ones, you'll end up with, as I say, like a cartoon effect, which we don't want to do with that, not in this painting. And that can sweep down underneath. And a little bit more there. Okay. I think that is coming together. Now then, let's go for a darker tone. Are you ready? What do you mean, yes? Of course you are. Right, here we are. I'm going to go for... Let's have a look on the top of the head first. I think work on the top of the head first of all, looking at the reference photograph. I'm going to go for... A mixture of the blacky brown I think first because looking at the colors on there around this area here the fairly dark blacky brown and but we actually start going to the black and blue mix as we head further up and that's because the head is obviously going up and over as you can imagine uh, so because of that we have to allow for that and we allow for that by changing the color as we work our way up when we start to get the recesses around the eyes with the darkest mix, that's when it will start working as well for us. But you just have to be patient. I remember one of my members said to me on my website, she said um, um, that uh, I didn't think it was going to come together, Paul. I really didn't think it was going to come together until I started adding the darkest colours. And that's when it started to work. It's all that preparation beforehand. So Lamp Black and Burnt Umber now to a creamy consistency I'm going to start adding this in now somebody asked me yesterday about the um, the paints I use I tend to use mostly Windsor and Newton and they are as I mentioned the um, the half pans which are these here look there you go so half pan paints and I also make myself a little color swatch card as well just kind of remind myself <laughs> when I go to the colors oh what was that one again I've been doing it 40 odd years you'd think I'd know by now wouldn't you um, but <laughs> I still forget even now God, must be age you know 51 I'm getting old I know I know I know but make yourself a little color swatch as well but Winter Newton the ones I've used for for years and I just got used to them really um, and there's two types which I buy from them and that's the the student quality ones which are the Cotsman range I do use them and also the professional ones as well the pro range um, which are pretty good as well just very you know thicker consistency higher pigmentation within the paints as well so for me they do actually last a lot longer to be honest with you so sometimes it's a bit of a no-brainer when you spend the extra little bit of money on the more professional ones because um, they do tend to kind of go much further for me especially when you're working in detail all the time now you can see I'm working my way down gradually around the eye looking at the shapes I'm going to start mapping out the darker areas now there we go so this is burnt umber and lamp black as I said start mapping out those darker areas and this is where we start to think about the overall shapes coming in 
trying to overlap these you know just as I come along in front of the head but I don't want this this color to be too thick and too dark as it comes around there this is this is too dark at the moment it needs to be lightened needs to be a little bit bluer and there's a bit of a, a patch just above the eye there again you see that in the photograph how that kind of works its way up like a big I don't know like a big eyebrow really isn't it and then looking at the direction these lines go in around there okay now I mentioned about the palette earlier on as well is that I don't I do use plastic palettes occasionally but only when I'm using watercolor white sometimes um, I use it because when you look at this one for example when it dries, like this is nearly dry here, you can see that on this side it's actually a little bit lighter than this side. That's obviously because it's hardly more concentrated there. But it gives you an indication what it would be like with more than one layer of that same colour. See what I mean there? And that applies there. And you can see the way this is lied flat in here. With plastic palettes, I've always found, my personal experience anyway, is that they're very often dry they very often dry quite like a bubble of water don't they and that's how they they tend to kind of work their way up into the palette so you can't really see those differences within the mixing well so if you've got an old white saucer or something like that you can use that white plate anything like that will be fine you don't have to buy these arty palettes if you don't want to it's handy having the sections in there but i know people have used some different ones you can use for baking as well i don't know which ones they were now but they were ceramic um, was it to do with some of the nibbles that you put on tables that when you get little selection nibbles and you can put them into these ceramic plates you know the ones I mean that sort of thing you can use as well just as a means of separating the colors or you can just use one whole plate <laughs> okay so now I'm looking at the way these lines go up and it's all different sections as you can see here so I'm gradually adding these in overlapping the lines checking the direction of the lines again and also roughly the, the kind of rough um, kind of length of these lines at the same time just a little bit more there but these are fine lines is what we're working with I know they are and I know people struggle with fine lines but remember what I said in part one to get the fine lines it's all about how you load your brush and as I said as well, if you're going to load it, you're going to roll it, you pull away. Okay. I'm going to get your kitchen roll. Let's get a clean bit, shall we? Or nearly. And give it a tap. So load it, roll it, tap it, or dab it. And then you'll have a nice, decent kind of tip on the brush. As long as it's a newish brush anyway, I've got a kind of tip on it. That's what matters. And that way it shouldn't be too overloaded when you start adding these little details on. But it's amazing what you can get with anything like this because you can really start thinking about fine even fine when there's not a lot of paint when I've not dabbed this one and you can see that's as fine as it can go then you can increase the pressure and come off again that's how much you can actually utilize just a small bristle brush if I take a little bit of paint off this is how fine you can go with this I don't I don't with this little brush that's how tiny you can go just by taking off that little bit of paint to remember to dab it and that's the effect you should hopefully I'll keep my fingers crossed for you kind of get all right go on you can do it you know you can if you ever find a project that you think is a bit too challenging for you give it give it a go anyway or as I mentioned to my members as well is is you know when you look at the difficulty levels I've got on my website look at the ones you want to use so if you think about intermediate you think well it might be a bit too difficult for me just choose a part of that painting just paint the eye if it's a dog a cat a wolf whatever it might be um, a fox which we've got on there so it depends on what you want to paint you know just paint the eye or the, or the mouth or, or the ears or anything just something to try out so you can just give it a go you know once you work on different elements like that and you start to understand how they all form and you become confident in painting those little elements then you can attempt the main painting that's how I would look at it okay so do it in small steps 
don't try and go in too quick in one go so just do it gradually otherwise sometimes people can you know fall at the first hurdle and get frustrated and give up but don't do that just um, give it a go just take your time and just try lift different little parts you don't have to do the whole painting I have a pad of paper where you can do four corners or four sections just section it off in four and give that a try Okay, now I'm using the watered down version of this um, burnt sunburn lamp black at the moment. I may still have to go a little bit darker just for the front, the very front of the head. There we go, something like that. A little bit more. I think this will be um, quite a nice detailed one today, this one. So trying to put these the lightest lines in first of all. I'm not trying to put the stripe the kind of stripes you can see within the head, just the lightest lines, just by barely grazing the paper. So this really is a dry brush technique I'm using now. And all that is, there we go again, bring it back out, Paul. Dry brush is when you're just catching that paper, see that? So you can just see the texture of the paper coming through. So that's all I'm basically doing with nearly, nearly dry brush is ready for reloading. And that's when I can just go in here and just use it before I reload it. Just to add those extra little details, which are barely visible, but they are there. We know they're there anyway, don't we? Okay, so back to the blacky brown, and I'm going to carry on and add some more in there now. But what I might do first is have a quick drink of coffee. And while I'm doing that, I'm going to show you what I get up to each day of the week with my members on my website. So uh, I'll be back in two minutes time. Well, I hope you're enjoying watching the video so far. Why don't you try and learn the way that I paint? So I'm going to show you how to use my techniques and the way I produce these very detailed wildlife paintings. And I do this on my online school on my website. So I'm going to take you across there now and show you how all that works, okay? And give you some general idea what it's all about. Now, when you arrive at my website, click on the membership icon, then down to the tutorial dashboard. I'll show you what the main tutorial dashboard looks like to so give you some general idea on how easy this is to kind of navigate. So every month you get access to a full PDF step-by-step -step tutorial as well, which obviously can paint using this offline, so you don't have to be online watching the videos. So you can have a look at the most recently added tutorials, as you can see there's a line of those there. But then just below we've got the main tutorial index, okay, so we've got the birds, animals, insects, botanical. So going on to the birds, you find we've got different levels as well. So we've got beginner, intermediate, and also advanced. Let's say, let's say the wolf. So here you can see the level of ability, which I'd recommend for this particular painting, how long the video content is. You'll also be able to download the reference photograph and of course the outline drawing, and even a little mini PDF pack as well, which contains all those items together, including a list of the colors which you're gonna use for this particular painting. As you go below the video, you can see all these little links down there which are highlighted. So if you click on one of those links, let's just say, let's say the mouth. All right, so just go to the area where the mouth starts to play. And it takes that timeline on the video look straight to that section of the video. So you can play it directly from there. Oh, and don't forget as well, when you are a paid member on my website, then you find you get 25% discount for all the written PDF tutorials which I have within my shop. So another bonus as well. Now the free member section, you get three videos here. All right, so you have the Robin, the Bee Eater, and also a Cat's Eye Paint Along, which I did live. So why don't you join as a free member and see if this is the right thing just for you. Now when you join my website on a monthly or annual subscription, you'll get access to over 60, I know, 60 video tutorials. And I tend to add on average three new ones every single month as well. So it's continually growing, so you get access to the entire back catalog. Not forgetting our private Facebook group. Sit, relax, and paint along with me using my non-technical jargon way of painting, and with a smile or two along the way. So let's get them brushes wet, and let's get started. Well, there you go. That wasn't too bad, was it? Hope you enjoyed that. Gives you some ideas what I do on a day-to-day -day basis here in North Devon. I know, in a very rural little place in North Devon. Out the way. Nearest shop seven miles away. I know. That's where our post office is as well, actually, I think. Okay. Carrying on with the blacky brown colour. Still being very technical, I know. Just adding this in to a little bit more. I'm trying to think about 
more kind of defined areas that we can see a little marking so I've got another marking coming down there a lot just a little more down there there you go um, I'll tell you what I might do I might just make that a little bit bigger for you so you can just see it uh, probably about there is that better yeah of course it is there you go I can do all these things it's magic you know it's magic um, just add some more details in there now this has gone quite creamy so you can see what I'm using here a lot really creamy now because it's starting to dry underneath my lights here but I like it like that I like it when it's creamy because we can start thinking about the really dark areas now then let's just add this one above the eye first I kind of add in this in so it's getting a little bit darker and just working around that area there so remember to click on subscribe that'd be brilliant thank you very much uh, a little bit darker and you can see I'm just trying to pull this down now around this area but I'm easing off this color I want some of this color just to, to kind of show through underneath so don't paint it all in completely dark because it's not but where we got the white lines coming across I need this there as I mentioned earlier because we want that white to really stand out but for it to stand out we just need that darker layer behind it okay right that's better now just add that in first I'm just going to define some of these lines now by just using directional lines again the way it all grows and goes but leaving gaps in between I don't want them too solid and if they get too solid you can lift paint off remember it's your painting you can do that so you can start to lift the paint off and just um, you know just play with it and move it around I think that's a good thing about watercolors people tend to think that it's not forgiving it can be forgiving but it depends on what you do with it some colors can be staining okay um, so you have to kind of prepare for that as well but you only get to know that through painting and through learning the colors that you've got within your palette I suggest what you do as well if you're just starting out with watercolors stick with a basic set of watercolors say 12 18 different colors nothing more than that because it can get confusing there's such an array of kind of colors on the market there really are try and mix those colors that you haven't got with the colors that you have got and that's just by playing with the paints as I said make yourself a little color swatch like this like I've done with mine and um, go from that and see what colors you can make okay just trying to see where these come down now these are very fine these lines coming down to the front of the beak bring it right down to the yellow and they're not all in line either are they some of these are just you know some are kind of staggered as you come around they've all going that same direction all the time though there we go so what do you find difficult about watercolors okay so what's your hardest thing you find difficult to do don't just say all of it but just <laughs> all of it now what do you find difficult to do just post in the description down below okay so if you do that not in the chats because the chat will go eventually just put it in the description down below and um, you'll be able to see that and I'll answer that later on as well actually so I like to look through people's comments and what they've said I do see your comments as I mentioned I really do Now working that round underneath the eye this is gradually getting darker now so you can see this gradual build up and when we start adding the, the lighter colour over the top that's when as I said it will start kind of pop out a bit more now I mentioned that blacky blue colour we had before which was remember lamp black and phalo blue I'm going to use a little bit of that now just around the back of the head for some of these markings that we can see just the very top and that just add that little bit of paler or you know, kind of receding colour because blue is a receding colour isn't it it's why very often when you see landscape painters paint distant mountains like a hint of blue because it just disappears whereas in reality it's still green but it's true though isn't it you think mm, I want to paint a landscape scene but it's still uh, 
but still lots too close to be that that distant mountain why is that paint but a little bit of blue in it you want a cold color or cool color in there but that applies to wildlife as well so you're adding a cool color into something like the top of the head and it depends on how the, the depth of color you're using so if you're using darker colors in the foreground pale colors in the uh, in the background then you find it will give that curved and that distant feel as you work it in there now here we go I'm going to start working now around the eye oh scary no he's not we can do these things so staying with the burnt umber and lamp black this is where we start adding the darkest mix I know I love it when I go dark on there and I'm looking at the overall shape my brush is a little bit overloaded at the moment but I don't mind I'm going to make use of that because it's overloaded I'm not going straight to underneath the eye just yet I'm going to work in those darkest areas as you can see here thinking about that V shape again so you're going to go darker now not too worried about that area it's not too dark in there is it but now it's time to run out of paint I can now go to the areas which just need a little bit of touch here and there I don't want to blop it with blop it blot it blot it with lot <laughs> with lots of paint in one go what am I like I don't know I'm losing the plot <laughs> I've been talking on videos for many years and I still lose a plot every now and then oh dear okay underneath the eye or underneath the arches I'm looking at the direction that these go I'll behave myself now be serious Paul be serious okay so they're going more towards two o'clock then branch off to three o'clock it's getting that late already and then come down towards about four o'clock and then work our way around that eye so now we're going to give the eye a little bit more structure just around the outside edge of it I don't know if we'll get the wing done today I might do that one off camera because I don't think we'll have enough time for that one but we'll try and do around the eye and show you how to get the depth of color and the white over the top as well we'll see what we get done anyway as I said you should never rush your painting never never okay and start to add in some of these darker marks now around the edge of this kind of white patch this is still that brownie black color I may add a little bit more black in there yeah we'll see now this area here the lines are very very fine and because they're fine I'm going to use my nearly dry brush again remember that when it's nearly dry that's when you want to head to those lighter finer areas with any painting that you do on wildlife with watercolors especially obviously because you know there's very little paint on the brush but and you also know you can create some very tiny marks like that until you've got no paint left on there and you've got to reload like I'm just having to do now then you carry on with the darkest areas in this case those little V's just tint that down there so it's more or less dry brush now a little more paint ball there we go carry on with the darkest areas working my way down just down the side there you can use um, if you wanted to a scumbling technique for this area as well and that's quite an interesting one isn't it the scumbling technique and all it simply is is that using the side of the brush like so and doing all this kind of textured marks with the brush that's all scumbling so you can do that to create the extra texture I kind of fill in an area but leaving gaps in between you see and that's what it does that's what I like about using the scumbling technique and I've used it for a variety of things down from um, obviously wildlife through to doing render stonework brickwork um, anything really even even down to painting sand quite an interesting one as well by scumbling and also splattering <laughs> I know some good names good terms isn't there scumbling and splattering when you splatter the paint onto the paper that's when you have really good fun like some mad artist throwing the paint at them no you don't throw it you sprinkle it you lightly flick it By using the brush and flicking it or using an old toothbrush which I've used as well so that's splattering we're not doing that today 
but not the splatter orchestral with lots of little details. But I would do that very often if I'm painting wood. Not all the time, but sometimes I do. If I want a really kind of lovely textured looking wood going on, then I'll use a splattering technique to create that effect. There we go. A little bit more information for you, and we're not doing that today either. Okay, I'll just add in this in now towards the sides here, bringing it out and bringing it down. Now, remember, I said about where the yellow comes around there, and that kind of branches where well, the white will come over the top of this. But this is really dark in there, it's not pitch black, you know, we can see. But it's really dark in this area here, so I'm just going to map it out first so I don't lose my way. Can't see in the dark, but I don't want to lose my way in there, so I'm just going to lightly tap it and then pull a few lines out around there. I'm getting all mellow now. And then bring this out down there, like that. It's amazing, I've been down in Devon for. 30 odd years and I still go a mixture of Devonian and Derbyshire so I'm from Chesterfield in Derbyshire originally well I actually born in Manchester don't tell anybody no I don't mind <laughs> I lived in Chesterfield for many years so I've got a bit of a mixture of accents going on if you wonder where my accents from there you go so now you can see this getting darker just underneath. I come from a mining family. <laughs> They're all underage. Oh, ho, ho, ho. okay. And then bringing that over, overlapping these lines gradually as I'm going along. And there we go. Yay! That's better. Okay, a little bit more down here now. I'm going to gradually ease these lines out now. I don't want them all dark in there now. So I'm going to space them apart as I'm doing this. I'm kind of working on this layer using my double zero brush. I'm thinking about this kind of sweep as it comes down over the body as well. You can see why I did this lot off camera. But it's exactly the same process. sweeping down off the body I say if you've got any comments any questions you want to ask pop them in the description down below I know I said it earlier just in case anybody's watching for new just come online and said oh hello it's that Paul again it's that bloke again painting I'm thinking about the darkest areas as I'm doing this I'm also considering the folds of the feathers at the same time so for example we've got an area here which kind of folds underneath and we've got an area, uh, I'm trying to see where that one goes. We've got an area there which folds underneath. But you don't have to copy them slavishly. You really don't. You have to be exactly the same as a reference photograph. You know, you can just make a, a representation of it. Let's put it that way, shall we? So it doesn't have to be the same. I'm sure they're all slightly different in their own way anyway. I've said it many times, as long as you're happy with the painting, or happy-ish, then that's what matters. I don't think I should, I've ever been completely 100% um, happy with a painting, which I'm glad I'm not because I've always believed that if you can find mistakes and errors and little happy accidents or whatever within your paintings, then there's always room for improvement. You can always learn something new. If you can find the mistakes and even better, if you know what you did wrong, <laughs> if you think, oh, I can do it slightly different next time around, then you know there's always room for improvement. We're always learning within the art world. We really are, you know. And that's why a lot of people, you know, do do a lot of painting as as a hobby, and then take it up a little bit more full time, especially when they retire as well, because you're always learning it. So you know, working with videos like live videos like mine or my website, or buying magazines like um, Leisure Painter, Painters Online, that kind of thing as well then you find you know there's always more to learn from reading watching and uh, and well and doing it painting it so there you go right so I'm going to start working now underneath 
make sure you've got plenty in that area because remember we're going to be covering that up very shortly not all of it but with some white paint so we're working underneath the beak I can see now that we've got a darker line going underneath so I'm just going to paint that in first of all take your time don't get a handshake at this one okay and then add that darker line in first and then start tapering that out by just adding just a few fine lines away as you come away from it see what I mean so you're just gradually getting darker and towards underneath the beak and then gets lighter by spacing those lines apart and overlapping them these elongated crosses as you come away and the same there there's a few odd strands of feather bits coming away from the side of the beak as well so what I'm going to do I'm going to show you adding the watercolor white and if we've got any time left over because there's no time value I know that let's see how we get on we'll let them work on the wing down the side here as well okay so you want to be able to do this now we know that all this area is the same as what I've done here the only difference is it's just bigger so all these areas down here are just larger areas. I'm thinking about different blocks as I'm coming along. So remember these V-shapes as we're saying around there. So these are all in individual blocks as you come around. And that's the way I tend to work that. Just give us some ideas how that was actually put together and how I kind of viewed it. Right, scroll my reference photograph. Here we go. And start looking now around here. And adding these lines in. See this brush is drying out again. I've got to reload it at some point soon. But I'm kind of hanging on and hanging on. So I can get those finer marks. And then, even now, oh, now I'm going to have to do it. Now I'm going to load. And because it's really dark down here, I'm going to use a newly loaded brush, not a fully loaded. And that's just underneath this feather here. You can just see the one in question on the reference photograph. Just underneath. We'll carry on, shall we? We'll carry on. Try and do this wing first, actually. I'll carry on with that first. I'm sure you're okay. I hope you've got a cup of coffee in front of you while you're watching this. I've just drunk mine. <laughs> Cold. Anyway, um, so working my way down the length of the body. Now, this wing is slightly going around a little bit, so I'm going to get a bit more of that phalo blue. But, there's always a but. I'm going to add in just wash that brush out one thing you should do on a regular basis by the way everybody is keep washing that detail brush out or any brushes you're using constantly keep washing it out because what will happen is that the paint will seep into the metal ferrule here and then eventually your bristles will just do this okay so just remember to keep washing this brush out because uh, I mean my brushes are not expensive but it's uh, obviously a bit of a pain when they start splitting and you know you can still use them to a certain degree but um, it's a bit difficult to kind of get the finer details when they do. I mean, one of these detail brushes will probably last me two or three paintings. But for three pounds ago, they're not too bad, actually. So I'm going to get a little bit of lamp black in there, mixed with the phalo blue. So it's more black than blue. And I want this more to a kind of creamy consistency. It's just really, really dark stuff now. And as I said before as well, is that I always like to add a colour to black. I don't use black on its own because it can look a little bit flat, which you find. So I'm going to load it, I'm going to roll it, I'm going to tap it, and away we go. So, what should we do first? I don't know really. Anywhere that needs to be darker, we can add this in. All right, so I'm going to just add a little bit in round there before carrying down the wing a minute. So we've got a darker colour mixed up. A little more around the eye. Just move my reference photograph a minute. Where's that go around there? Oh yeah. A little bit round there. Okay. So where are you watching from today actually? Just post that in the comments. I'd like to know. Where are you watching this video from today? Don't say your sitting room, your living room. Where where are you? In the UK? In in the in the States? Where are you watching from? <laughs> Put a little comment down below. I'd love to hear from you and I'll reply to you later on, okay. Right, okay. Uh just working that down a little more down there. Um 
Tell you what I have got if you're interested as well. I have done another live video on how to paint a cat's eye as well. And again, I got the reference photograph and the outline drawing for you if you fancy having a go at that. Just painting a cat's eye, a very detailed cat's eye. Lovely cat's eye as well, actually. It's like a pale green in colour. Very, very nice. So what I'll do, I'll pop a little card in the corner after this has gone live. So you can just click on that and you can have a go at that. And you can, so you can download all the relevant material, well, not materials, but the photograph and everything else. That you need, and the colour chart as well, by the way. Now I'm going to use this colour now just to start to map out a little bit more detail around this wing. Gradually fill that in a little bit down there. And then bringing this down just down to there and then down the wing. Make sure that's the bottom of the photo, which it is. And try and see where that goes. Oh yeah, and I'm going to fill in now because I've got this blacky blue colour, but a little more black than blue. Just these little sections on the wing as well. Okay, and a little section down there. Again, look closely at that reference photograph. You really need to because you want to make sure you get these in the right place. But again, who's going to know if you haven't, apart from yourself? I'm sure you can look just as good anyway. I'm sure you're painting a lot nice. And just a few more down there. I'm trying to leave gaps in between so some of that colour kind of shows through. Then that comes down to a little V. Just that one there. And we've got another one. Okay, so far. Very lightly. Hardly any pressure whatsoever. Two hairs in air. That's all it is. That's what I've got in my head. <laughs> Two hairs in air. <laughs> Barely touching that paper. Okay. Now, we've got this section down here as well. So we've got that area there. So we've got a little section here. So I'm also going to very lightly touch in like that. That comes down to there. Okay. Again, I'm really looking closely at that photograph so I can just make out where things go. And these, some of these lines are quite spiky. So it's not just a straight line. So you can just very lightly lift off, leaving a gap in between. And that just sort of disappears there as well. I think it probably just appears again down there little bit wider and then disappears again where are you going come back there you go okay back to the brownie black color but this time the watery version I'm gonna add a little bit of this in just in places around the side down there just smudge up my finger just in places that's better very lightly touch it move it around it's my little world. We can make this work whatever way we want to make it. And there we go. Now, I think we're just about ready for adding the white paint. I'm just going to add a little bit more colour in there. That's the raw umber burnt, umber burnt sienna and a alizarin crimson. Just to warm it up a little bit more down there. Just before we add the white in. And the same applies to a bit of this around there as well. Yeah, that'll do. Okay, and we can always add more dark over the top of the white. See, that's the beauty about white paint. Is it's quite, real, I quite like it actually, because you, you've got to play with it and go used to using white paint. But once you get used to using it, just fold that and just put that sheet of paper on the painting just briefly. Once you get used to using white paint, it's not a problem at all. Because you find that um, as long as you get the right consistency, you can overlay that white paint with another colour you can use it thinner and using it thinner works really well especially if you said let's say for example um, I painted a, a Bedlington Terrier a little while ago now and it's a white Bedlington Terrier I don't know if they're all white but it's a Bedlington Terrier white fur but very very curly fur if you know your dogs very very curly so how do you paint white fur and that's one of the questions I've been asked many times <laughs> and again this is the same kind of principle the way I've done this now, you've got to think about the background colours first of all, like I've done on here. 
and then you can add your light colors over the top by using a little bit of watercolor white now because my table is on this angle which it is you can't tell with the camera I know I'm going to add a little bit of water down at the bottom part of that so I can just drag that up into that there so when you're working with fur or feathers of watercolor white you would add this over those dark layers which are underneath as long as you can still see those dark layers coming through then this will work and you can always paint a color over the top of this as I say afterwards if need be as well All right, here we go that's it okay that's it for today no here we go start off on this side of the face I've used my piece of paper there haven't I on this side of the face and start adding this in now again don't overload that brush because we don't want big blobs of white paint going on less is certainly best when using white paint so less is best but you know, I'd suggest that add enough that you think is about right, but if you start to question yourself if you need to add any more, that's when you walk away from the painting. Go and put the kettle on, as I very often do. Then come back with fresh eyes and think, do I need it or don't I? Very often you think, probably not. Because white paint is really handy, but it can also kind of deaden the painting. So just be careful with that so we're going to get a little bit brighter so this is now thicker white so it's really creamy white and you find if it's too thick like that you can't paint that straight line without it without it breaking so i'm going to think about where this is going to go to now now when you're doing lines like this it's getting a little bit thinner i suggest what you do start from the inside out i'm trying to do it this way around because i'm left-handed but start from the inside out because then you get this tapered line I've got used to working this way. It's going to slide down my board, isn't it? I've got used to working this way over the years. Um, but um, for you, if you're doing hairs out the top of the head of a dog, a cat, or whiskers on, on anything like that, start from the inside of the animal and then taper it out. So you're lifting the brush off as you come away. And that's the way I tend to work with, um, say, animals, especially for whiskers and fine lines that kind of stick into the background of the paper or into a background a painted background as well so you can see now I'm just catching the paper now the way I'm doing this and just out of interest is that when you I've got a bit of paper there when you paint a line I'm ghosting first and then I'll catch I'm thinking about an oval at the same time so my 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 kind of shape of my hand is doing that so it's going in an oval shape like so and then catching it just on the bottom part of that oval just there look I'll just keep increasing that one around there there you go it's like a ripple in the water isn't it and that's what I'm doing creating this oval and just catching it on the downward stroke a little bit but ghost it first remember what ghosting was you went over the area time and time again and then gradually allowing your brush to touch the surface of the paper okay so I'll just put that over there so I think that's under the photograph isn't it sorry about that there is that better <laughs> just realize it's under the photo so I can't see the computer screen from where I am now these lines are quite short around here quite quite short so I don't want this I want it thick enough so it spreads so it does spread on the paper but I don't want it too thin so it dries fairly pale so thinking about allowing these dark areas to go through and remember that V shape around this area as well. So I'm thinking about these V shapes at the same time. So you've got that going that way. So more towards two o'clock, eight o'clock direction and then towards four o'clock, ten o'clock direction. Like little Vs. That's brighter. So there you go. Two o'clock, four o'clock, all the way down. And then pulling off that line, look at that, that's bright, around there. I was mentioned about the uh, painting cats and dogs and, and anything that's white actually. Is that if you're painting anything that's shaded, say underneath the chin of a dog, that's white, but yet the paint isn't white, is it? You can use watercolour white for that as well. I have in my tutorials which I are, which are film. And what I tend to do, I tend to just thin the white down that little bit. So you get the detail on underneath like we've done with the kestrel here. 
but then what you would do you thin the white down as it dries it dries duller so paler and sometimes if you have it really really watery like there lot I mean that's really watery just in the corner of the screen then you find that will dry very very pale indeed this one a little bit thicker actually thank you um, so that's really handy for areas in the shadows as well for anything that's white be it a white dog cat bird mouse white mouse well, I suppose you can get albino mouse okay, yeah. so anything like that really ant um, right so these are very tiny marks now coming towards the eye very very easy weensy again thinking about you know that um, that oval I was on about uh, this one here look I'm doing that but very small very small indeed and that's what I'm doing kind of catching the bottom part of that oval just flicking those up in the direction I can see they go in and then doing the same around the front okay let's just carry on with this area first and we just had some in the front there as well okay so same again overlapping elongated crosses but trying to work in that sort of get you know correct direction all the time and the way this this works more towards three o'clock four o'clock five o'clock as it comes down but overlapping those lines all the time as you do so okay it's a little bit more around there now now if you want to learn a little bit more about using watercolor white I'll tell you what I've actually done I've created a, um, a playlist on watercolor white as well um, so I'll put a little, little link above my palette there wait get out of the way so I'll put a little link just up there once it's gone live after it's gone live for you to have a look at okay so that'll give us some ideas on other subjects which I've painted when I've been using watercolor white okay right and then working my way down where's that go oh that goes down to there as well a little bit more thinking about the sweeping motion all the time these look really long don't they but they're not they're not that long in, in reality when you look at the photograph really close up you can see it's a lot of shorter lines but creating that kind of sweeping motion as it comes down okay that's quite bright there but I'll tell you what I'm going to do I'm going to add the brighter color in just initially around there I'm going to tint it so I'm going to tone it down with a little bit of colour over the top once it's dry and I'll show you all about that in a minute you have to do it in a, in a particular way the way I show people um, otherwise it could just blur okay it could just blur away that's a pop group that wouldn't it blur oh, yeah okay that's bright around there and for those brighter areas like just this area here just go over the same area again leaving gaps in between though barely touching that paper just to brighten it up a little bit more there you go thinking about the overall shape as you do so that's looking better now the brighter around there okay wash your brush out keep washing that brush out remember otherwise you will find you will start to clog up and I said it could just do that at the end of it which we don't want to happen now I'm going to go for a weaker version this white now tap it and I'm going to add this in now underneath in the dark area don't go in the dark area but it's in there it's in the dark area there look and you find this will dry a little bit paler and because of that it could still be we'll still be able to see it but it could set it back a little bit more and if we need to set it back any more than that we can just go over again with a little bit of color over the top like I just mentioned So this really is using thin paint, isn't it? So you can really go thin with the paint. So the thicker paint is obviously the, the brighter colour and the thinner paint being this one here. Just by adding a little bit more water. I know people struggle when they're working watercolours, how much water to add. And again, that comes through playing with the paints and getting used to them. And I know it's frustrating sometimes, you know, when you make little mistakes and you can't quite get things right but treat it as a challenge not as a hindrance in any way just treat it as a challenge and you know enjoy just enjoy the learning process of it I'm still learning after all these years I'm always going to be learning as I mentioned earlier on
but just, just part of the learning process is to try and get the consistency right of the watercolour. It really is. And just to kind of um, get used to just the flow of the paint, really. And how it works on your paper, because this paper I'm using, by the way, I think I mentioned it before, not today, I don't think it does, is one made by Bockingford. So it's Bockingford, and it's a cold pressed paper. In other words, they're all wearing cagoules and um, thermal gloves when they're making it. No. It's cold pressed, in other words, it's, been, it's gone through cold rollers when it was made. Not hot pressed HP, which obviously gone through hot rollers. There you go, that was easy, isn't it? Um, so it's a cold pressed paper, so it's got a, a medium textured surface on it, which is what I prefer to have. I just find that when I'm adding washes of colour on there, if I do the large background, it tends to kind of soak into the paper nicely and gets a nice little kind of little effect as well with the slightly textured paper. So this is, as I said, a cold press paper um, by Bockingford, but there's a lot of different manufacturers, but you've got to get used to the paper that you use. So I suggest stick with one paper to begin with, just for a while until you get used to using it, because they all perform in a different way. I'll put it this way, when I, um, I thought I'd do a little bit of a testing on this before I went live yesterday for part one of this video, and I found the paper I was testing on, which I forgot all about actually, was one I've not used in many years. I dug it out of the cup and I thought, what's that one there then? Oh, that'll do. And it, the paint just didn't flow the same. And I thought, well, what's going on? What am I doing wrong? I've lost out. I don't know how to paint anymore, you know. And I t found out it was just had the wrong paper. I could tell by the texture. Afterwards, I realised, oh, come on, Paul. do. You know, you should know better than that. So it goes to show, you know, you find the textures of the paint, of the paper, sorry, do vary and the way they absorb the paint so try and play with the paper that you've got and try and get used to that one paper that you use okay there we go that's my advice on papers for you now you can see I'm gradually adding this now to the front of the head just to kind of get that light area that shape which you're looking for overlapping these lines at the same time gradually does it take your time there's no rush remember if you find that you've um, been sat there for a long while, for let's go wash this brush out by the way, for more than 45 minutes to an hour, you've been and you're still sat there painting away, take a break. Okay, good magazine that, but take a break and just um, just come as I say, go make a cup of coffee again. <laughs> it's a lot of cups of coffee I have, you know. But, uh, go make a cup of coffee and then you can come back with fresh eyes again. Just having a good good stretch first before you carry on. Um, I find that helps, it really does. It's difficult to remember to take a break as well. So gradually adding these layers over now, coming over the dark areas. When you start branching over these dark areas, that's when you think, oh, 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 that's working. You know, start getting excited by it. I get excited, too far too easy, I really do. When I'm painting, it's quite nice. Just to um, to know that it's working and coming together. A little bit more in there now. Well, I'll tell you what we need to do. It's a little bit around the back of the head. I can just see that on the reference photograph. Just a little bit round there. And where you've got all these lines coming down, paint these in a creamy consistency first, and we'll tone them. That that be um, the last process we'll do on here. I think just toning them down afterwards. Okay. Where's that go there? Oh yeah, that goes about there. And then work my way down to there. And back to you, babe. That's another song, I know. I'm bringing some lines. Oh, we can see some lovely lines going out around here as well. So I'm going to very lightly flick these out in the correct direction, of course. More towards like an 8 o'clock direction, they are. Bringing it down there few more around there so I hope you're enjoying this so far it's something which I enjoy doing I like painting kestrels I've painted quite a few over the years and um, they are lovely birds to paint and it's a good way of getting to know how feathers are kind of formed and how they all overlap as well so it's worth having a go and giving it a try I know I like to and try different birds as well if you'll enjoy painting birds as I do as I mentioned I do like to paint other animals as well I've got lots of videos on Things like wolf, fox, even a duckling. There you go. How about a duckling? Even a um, harvest mouse. It's a lovely one. It's a popular one, that one. Okay. 
Oh, I'm going to bring a few across just down here as well. Very lightly flicking. Again, keeping this paint to a creamy consistency. Okay. Now remember with all the consistencies I use, I did the same part one, but we've got four consistencies which I tend to stick to. And the four consistencies are watery, it's like you get out of the tap, out of the faucet. There's milky, a little bit thicker than water. So not only a little bit thicker. And that's when you know that when it's watery, there you go, look. That's watery there, look. See how runny it is. That will run down the side of here very quickly. Milky is when it's a little bit thicker. It takes a little bit longer to run down. Creamy is when it kind of clings a little bit and eventually starts running and it's got all the time. And then you've got thick as well. And you can imagine what that one's like. Straight out of the tube or from the half pan. A bit difficult to get a thick paint from the half pan. Okay, so just adding these in now, thinking about the edge of this wing, I just lightly adding the colour, well, I'll say colour white in there, just to finish this wing off more. And then flick a few out. Now then, I'll tell you what we haven't done yet. There's some dark hairs just over the yellow part of the nostril. So I'm going to add that in. So this is going to be that blacky brown colour, so lamp black and burnt umber. Do this to a creamy consistency. So we're going to add these in first of all, and we need to kind of darken down here. It's where we start to sort of fine tune areas. So little, little tiny hairs flicking around and flicking through. Where did they go? Just over across the beak a little bit. See that? So that's what we're trying to achieve. Just put a few in. Then flicks up towards its its head. It's having a bit of a bad hair day this one, isn't it? And joins on to the rest of that area. That's better, that's more like it, isn't it? That's brought it together. And we've got a few odd ones coming across the lower mandible just around there. Okay. And I think we need to think about adding a bit of colour tint now. And to do that. I'm going to go for a little mixture of that raw umber and burnt umber, which is that one there. Load your brush up. And this is where we go over the top of the watercolour white. Okay, so this is what I mentioned earlier on. The thing with watercolour white is that you need to just do this in one fell swoop. And all I mean by that is that when you go over white paint, um, like on my test card here, you just do it in one go, very lightly in one go. If I keep going over that same area, that white paint just smudges and blurs. So you just have to do it in one go and very lightly as well. So I'm going to load this brush. Oh, I'm going to roll it. There you go. So load it, roll it, give it a dab on some kitchen roll, load it, roll it, dab it. And then we'll go in. Where's my bit of paper now? I can have it back now. Look. Hey, where you been? And start to add in over some of the white, not all of it. Just a little bit of colour. There you go. That's a bit much in places, especially underneath the beak here as well, because it's that's not quite white, is it? Just a few more under there, just to bring it down. Um, anywhere else? But don't cover it all up. You can add some more white over the top, but let it dry first, or give it a blast with a hairdryer before you do. And I think, I do for the covering up side of things. I'm going to add a bit more of this colour into this wing as well, just so it varies the colour and the texture we can see within it. And just down this bare area down there, it looks a bit bland, a little bit flat down there. Just with a few little kind of darker marks that we can see just around there. Okay. There's a few more there as well. Okay. Now, if you want to have a look at painting birds of prey, things like falcons, eagles, and hawks, that kind of thing as well, or falcon, eagle, and a hawk, I'll pop a little um, link in my playlist um, in a minute, so you can see that there. So stay tuned for that, so you can have a play with that, and just watch that one through and see what you think, actually, because obviously painting different birds is good fun. It really is. So I hope you enjoyed this one today, and uh, until next time around, I'm going to say one 
last thing, keep them brushes wet and thank you very much for watching.